Hello, welcome to another in our series of Windows on Advent. And today we'll be particularly looking at Isaiah chapter 9. It's day 12 in our series. And we'll be staying with Isaiah for a while because it's such a key book in terms of the prophecy, messianic prophecies in the Old Testament. Yesterday we talked a little bit about how in chapter 7, Isaiah came to King Ahaz and said to him, ask the Lord for a sign. He said, I won't do that. I won't put the Lord to the test. And Isaiah said, is it too much uh, for you to mess around with men? You've got to mess around with God as well. But the Lord will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive and will be named Emmanuel, which means God with us. And if only he'd have trusted God, uh, he would have defeated his enemies. But he went to the Assyrians. He became a tribute nation. And basically, the, he, he began the end of the uh, Davidic line because they became a tribute nation from there on uh, in. I said something strange yesterday about within 65 years, that was what was written there, that Israel would be no more. And yet within 13 years, they're taken away, 722 uh, BC, they're taken away by the Assyrians. But the prophecy is true because it's within 65 years, is right at the end of their being taken away. So they're taken away, but the final group is taken away in 670 BC. So though this prophecy is, is occurring 735 BC, 65 years later, it, uh, it finds its fulfilment. Scripture never lies. Always trust Scripture. If you don't see it straight away, look a little bit more deeply. See if you can find the answer. So Isaiah has these two sons. He has Shea Jashub, who he took uh, with him to the king, whose name means a remnant shall return or a remnant shall repent. And Meir Shal al Hashbaz, whose name means um, quick to the plunder, swift to the spoil, which suggests that Israel, as well as its enemies, would both suffer under God's judgment. And in chapter 8, we read that the Lord would be a sanctuary for both houses, for Israel and for Judah, but also a rock on which they would stumble. Find that again in Psalm 118. We find it in 1 Peter chapter 2. We find it throughout the New Testament. Even the Lord Jesus speaks about that, about when he tells them the parable of the ten and farmers. So scripture time and again, finding its fulfillment later in the New Testament. And chapter, chapters 1 to 6, chapters of doom, judgment, with a little bit of light. The end of chapter 8, where we're beginning to see how God's going to bring light into people's lives. There's only doom, so we read, did we not? The end of chapter 8 we read. Then they will look towards the earth and see only distress and darkness and fearful gloom, and they'll be thrust into utter darkness. And then chapter 9 begins like this. Nevertheless, there will be no more gloom for those who were in distress. In the past, he humbled the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. But in the future, he will honour Galilee of the Gentiles by the way of the sea, along the Jordan. So God is saying that uh, there will be distress to the northern regions. Naphtali and Zebulun were some of the first to suffer the incursion of the, the Assyrians. But light would come from that area. And Isaiah calls it Galilee of the Gentiles. It's the only person to, to do that. He's the only person to do that. And of course, the Lord Jesus uh, ministers in the Galil, in Galilee, and he ministers to Gentiles as well as to to Jews. And Isaiah picks this idea up later on about Messiah being one who would minister not only to Jews but to Gentiles. We get a series of servant songs towards the end of um, Isaiah, or the middle of Isaiah really. Chapter 42, we read, I, the Lord, have called you in righteousness, this is the servant, I will keep you, I will take hold of your hand, I will keep you and will make you to be a covenant for the people, that's the Jews, and a light for the Gentiles to open eyes that are blind, minds of Jesus, to free captives from prison, to release from the dungeon those who sit in darkness. That'll come again in Isaiah 61, those sort of words. And in the third of the servant songs in Isaiah 49, we read similar things. We read, um, this is what the Lord says, in the time of my favour, I will answer you. And in the day of salvation, I will help you. I'll keep you and make you to be a covenant for the people, that's the Jews, to restore the land and to reassign its desolation, desolate inheritance, to say to the captives, come out, and to those in darkness, be free. So there's a promise to the land, to the Jews. But we find him saying earlier in that prophecy it's too small a thing for you to be my servant to restore the tribes of jacob and bring back those of israel i have kept i'll also make you a light for the gentiles that you may bring my salvation to the ends of 
the earth. So we're beginning to see how God, God uh, is going to bless all nations as he promised through Abraham. The Jews, time and again, thought the blessing was only for them, but God was blessing all of the nations through Abraham. So this light is introduced to us initially at the uh, start of chapter 9. The people walking in darkness, this is verse 2, have seen a great light. That's going to remind us of um, the angels with the shepherds in the fields, isn't it? On those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. So at the darkest period in Judah's history, um, the, the Saviour is going to come, isn't he? And then we get three verses. You have enlarged the nation and increased their joy. They rejoice before you as people rejoice at the harvest, as men rejoice when dividing the plunder. So in verse three, there's joy promised. In verse 4, for as in the day of Midian's defeat, you have shattered the yoke, the burdensome, the bar across their shoulders, the rod of their oppressor. Here, the king, the promised king, will bring deliverance. And in verse 5, every warrior's boot used in battle and every garment um, rolled in blood will be destined for the burning, will be fuel for the fire. So there we have victory, joy, deliverance and victory, all for the future. And then we come to our text, really. Isaiah 9. Verses 6 and 7. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. The government will be on his shoulders, and he'll be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Let's leave that there and come to verse 7 uh, in a minute. So we read that to us a child is born, which reminds us that the promised king is going to be human. That's going to be important when we see that it relates to the Lord Jesus, because he will be a human being unto us a child is born and there are human parents though in the case of the lord jesus uh, it is mary who carries the lord jesus and uh, joseph becomes the surrogate father but we'll pick that up again later to us a son is given so a male is promised and he's of the royal line and it's not just that he comes through his parents but that he's given by god just as the Lord Jesus himself later will be not only human, he'll also be divine, which is why Joseph is not his earthly father. The government will be on his shoulders. People don't want to, to rule. Well, some do, but most would be happy to be ruled by uh, a fair uh, governor. The government will be on his shoulders and he'll be called. And here these uh, titles, they're not names, are they? Emmanuel was a real name. But these are titles. Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. As we hear these, are we really thinking about an earthly king? Or are we thinking about someone else? Remember the Lord Jesus himself. Where, when he was doing things, they, they were amazed at him. They were amazed at the things that he could do. It's the nearest the Hebrew has for a word that means supernatural, wonderful. Some people di distinguish between wonderful and counsellor. The others are double barrel things. Uh, some people say you should take these separately. There are five titles, not just four. Um, he's wonderful. And the counsellor points us to the king. Now, you wouldn't think that. You would think it's... Um, you would think it was a picture of an advisor to a king, but, but it isn't. In Micah chapter 4, uh, we read verse 9. Why do you now cry aloud? Have you no king? Has your counsellor perished? The pain seizes you like that of a woman in labour. The king was known as the counsellor. The king would sit at the gate, wouldn't he, and dispense counsel. Deal with this fairly quickly, I think. Um, or a wonder of a counsellor, if you prefer. Pick, pick up these themes of the Lord Jesus again, I think. Uh, this uh, king to come is going to be the mighty God. He's a person of power. And mighty God is, is used again in chapter 10, verse uh, 21. A remnant will return. There's Shia Jashub. A remnant of Jacob will return to the mighty God. Now, does that mean they'll return from another land to the mighty God? Or they will repent and return to the Lord? Shia Jashub, a remnant shall return. A remnant shall repent. This king will be a, the wonderful counsellor, the mighty God, the everlasting father. So he relates to his subjects. He's a father to them. He cares for them. He provides for them. He protects them. 
and he is the prince of peace prince means an administrator and peace of course means well-being wholeness harmony this king who is to come this marvelous king is going to bring a society of peace i think we'll leave that there i don't think we'll go on to verse uh, seven which speaks of the everlasting nature of his reign and we'll return to it uh, tomorrow and uh, look a little bit more closely at how this relates to the Lord Jesus. But until then, may the Lord bless you and keep you and make his face shine upon you, give you his peace, his righteousness at this Advent season.